Come, let us rejoice. Let us pray. Let us give thanks. Let us give thanks for all that God does and all that God is. Let us recall who God is and who God calls us to be. May we magnify God. Let us lift up our heads and voices and be glad. Amen. We're going to join together in our first hymn. It's Before the Throne. Let us unite together in prayer. Let us pray. Gathered here today from many places, we are together on this joyful Sunday of Advent to mark the hope that is always present with us. Even when we do not see it, that hope is among us. Let us find hope and strength in this company of friends, lifting up our voices together in a great song of praise to the one who is always with us. Loving God, we thank you for the joy that you give to our lives in so many ways. As we anticipate once more the arrival of Jesus in the world, we celebrate with joy. Help us today and every day to be grateful, to hear your word and to do your will by sharing joy with others. We ask it in the name of the one born of Mary, Jesus Son of God and Son of Mary, you came among us, baptising with fire and light, calling us to the true vocation of humanity, to reflect the glory of our Creator. We thank you for your work among us, how you gathered, how you spoke, how you ate and drank, how you left us your spirit to lift us up and hold us in the light. We praise you, because you came to us and keep coming to us because of your great love. Amen. And now let us unmute and unite in prayer as we share the prayer that Christ gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from sin. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. The readings from John chapter 1, verse, starting to read at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after you, after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. We're going to enter our breakout rooms now, and I'm going to show you on the screen now what the questions are before you go into your breakout rooms. Why was I asked to wear a striped jumper today? I'm wondering if it's become more apparent yet. When people ask you, who are you? What is your reply? And where is Christ among us? Why was I asked to wear a striped jumper today? And the clue was in the reading. When people ask you, who are you? What is your reply? And where is Christ among us? Going to create some breakout rooms and then I'm going to invite you to join those. So the rooms are open and the question again, why was I asked to wear a striped jumper in the light of the reading I've just heard? When people ask me, who am I? What's my reply? And where is Christ among us? Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm going to put the, the mute back on and then we're going to hear the readings from Les and from Janice. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3 and 10 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness and planting of the Lord to display his glory. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And the next reading is 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. This week, as I read our gospel passage, it seems to me that those visiting John were being put through a series of tests or quizzes or puzzles, all aimed to help them to enter into a new way of thinking about God 
and their faith. They came to John seeking answers as they were stuck in a place trapped by tradition, culture and their own limited knowledge of God. I don't condemn them for these things. It's all too easy to end up there. I often do too, putting God in too small of a box and thinking I know exactly where to find him and what he looks like. I wonder if you've ever noticed how like a very badly played game of guess who this morning's reading sounds. Clearly those questions, or those questioning John, think they might know who he is because John's first words to them sound like the response to a question. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? I am the voice. Those questioning John really don't know how to play this game, do they? They just keep guessing and they don't get the answers about him. They don't ask questions about him to try and work out his identity. They don't look at him to gain some clues. Their questions just seem like stabs in the dark. All the usual suspects are suggested, the Messiah, Elijah, the prophet. And so quickly they give up. John isn't much better. He plays along, but his answers are monosyllabic. And I wonder, is he really so unaware? After all, he's a teacher, he's a rabbi, he has followers, disciples of his own. Surely he knows how to help people to understand something far better than this. Is he toying with them, making fun of them? Or are the questions he's being posed too difficult to give answers to? Who or what is the Messiah? He leads them on a merry dance of, I'm not who you think I am. Finally, they give up. And they ask, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Instead of their labels, Messiah, Elijah, prophet, they ask him, well, what do you say about yourself? And John is finally able to explain with a different name, but not the name that I would give him the voice. Names are interesting and in John's gospel, John, Jesus's cousin, is simply John. No, the Baptist, tacked on the end. For the gospel writer, that is deliberate. The writer wants to make it abundantly clear that John's main role is not to stand in the River Jordan baptizing people. Instead, his called ministry is to witness to Jesus which is why in this gospel, we don't read of John baptizing Jesus at all. John is not the light, we are told. He came to testify to the light. John himself says as much, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John is the voice. Those questioning him still don't understand. And here's another puzzle, the voice? Have you ever watched the television programme, The Voice? Celebrity singers choose members of their team by beginning with their backs to performers. And whilst these performers sing their hearts out, the celebrities, if they like what they're hearing, turn round to indicate that they're good enough to join their team, that they're chosen. But it's only at that point that the celebrity singer, the judge, faces the singer and sees them for themselves. It's fun to watch because sometimes the judges are confused whilst turning away. They think two singers are one, or one singer is actually two. Sometimes they think women are men or men are women. Other times that someone quite young is more mature, just based on the sound of their voice. The not seeing is all great for television, Lots of fun. But if you're speaking to John, it's not so great. Those questioning him need the whole package, the whole picture, 
to understand. John is just giving them tempting clues from scripture. He references Isaiah as his own role. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. But though they understand he's not the Messiah that they are seeking, they're still looking at this in all the wrong way. They can hear what John is saying, but they still don't fully understand. They question him. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. Among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And it's that line, among you stands one you do not know. That's why I asked you to wear the stripy garments. That's why I've changed the background to this one. It's the hint, the reference to the Where's Wally cartoons that so many children have books and they search and search and search for this one character who's standing in this crowd scene and when you can see him he's glaringly obvious but when you first look at the page you can't as it were see the wood for the trees and I was reminded of that when I heard this reading among you stands one you do not know Jesus is right there the Messiah is right there and they can't see him for looking John has to turn them around, turn them around and explain the Messiah is amongst you. You've missed him with your old thinking about God. The Messiah didn't look as they had expected. Some expected him to be this almighty conqueror who would liberate them from the Roman occupation. Others had other views on who he was, but clearly none of them had got it because they had seen him. He was there in flesh and blood, and they still didn't get it. The Messiah didn't look like they expected. He wasn't announced as they thought he should have been. Though they had left the desert for the temple, and that's a movement, not only a physical journey, but if, of thought, they still looked to find him according to traditional understandings. And John is stood there telling them, that the journey, their puzzle, is still not over. It's not that they haven't been given enough, enough answers to riddles or puzzles. When we look at all of John's answers, the picture does emerge. He answers every question in relation to the one he bears witness to. He says, I am not the Messiah. I am not Elijah. I am not a prophet. I do, though, echo scripture and point to the light. John does his job again and again, helping them on their journey to find the Messiah, to understand what God is doing and to see God in their lives, right there with them. Not remote, but there, personal, tangible. He sends them on their way with much to ponder, and with one urgent final question. Where is the Messiah? He was amongst them, John said. I wonder, would we be any better at spotting him? Can you identify Christ? Do you know where he is right now? Can you see God in this Advent season? Can you find the Messiah in your neighbourhood? Do you recognise Christ in your daily lives? Can you point to Jesus if someone seeking him asks you? Listen to the words of Isaiah and take some time to quietly reflect on the clues that it gives us as to where the Messiah is to be found today. Isaiah says, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn, 
to give them a garland instead of ashes. Do you think that's what we, our neighbours, our world needs to hear this year, this year of all years? The Messiah is binding up the brokenhearted. As we sit down for our Christmas meals this year, there will be one million empty chairs where COVID victims would have sat. The Messiah is comforting those who mourn. I know of one person who emailed me yesterday to say that she would not be joining us for worship because it's a year since her mum died and she's having some time alone just to be and to remember. May she have a garland instead of ashes. Christ is with her this morning. The Messiah is proclaiming liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners and the year of the Lord's favour. If we want to be in the presence of God, then that's where we need to be, alongside the captives, alongside the prisoners. How many are becoming prisoners of debt and despair this year as job losses mount? How many wonder whether today is the day we will have Brexit clarity or not? How many watch their businesses teeter on the edge? John's gospel speaks of bearing witness, of being, as it were, like a mirror to the light, saying it's not about me. I'm simply here to reflect the one that it's all about. And he speaks of bearing witness many more times than the other three gospels. In this stripped back Christmas, at the end of this stripped back year, we are challenged to be like John. Not a voice necessarily crying in the wilderness, but definitely a voice proclaiming God is with you. God is among you. God is for you. It's not us. It's Jesus. Our witness is to Jesus. Amen. Let us unite in prayer as we bring to God our prayers of concern. Father, we rejoice in the hope of Christ among us, the light which dispels every darkness, especially at this time. In a year that has dimmed the lives of so many, we praise you for the anchor and security of your love and the new life you offer, which brings comfort and strength, peace and joy. Forgive us when we forget the good news of the coming of Christ and are tempted to put our hopes in the material, in decorations, feasts, festive gatherings. Forgive us when we forget the most precious gift of Christmas, relationship with you. This year, help us to rejoice in what we already have rather than what we hope to get. This year, let us not worry over what we cannot have, but rather know your presence in a simple Christmas. Help us to let go of our wants and desires and instead rejoice in what we can give, in loving you and our neighbour. Father, help us to celebrate our Christmas blessings and give each of us your Christmas vision to light up the whole world in every corner. We pray today for all who are downtrodden, all who are oppressed, all who know the heavy hand of marginalization upon them. God, we turn to you remembering the words of Mary, praying that you will lift up the lowly, you will raise the voice of justice and you will scatter oppression. May all who are oppressed be set free. We ask this in joy and gratitude. We pray that we might find rhythms of life that sustain us here. Rhythms for cultivating and renewing the earth, human community, justice and creativity. We ask this in joy and in gratitude. In your name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is... 
Abba Father, we unite in song together. quick reminder. In the gospel passage, we read that when people were praying for the Messiah to come, the Messiah was already among them. We never need to look for God as if God is not already here. We need to turn to God who is already here, always ready, always listening. This week, let us take time to listen to the breath, to the heart that is always beating knowing that as surely as the heart beats, God is always with us. And now the blessing. Gathered in, we have been nurtured by your spirit of life. Now sent out, we go in the assurance that your word lasts forever and your promises are true. Let the lowly be lifted up. Let the hungry be fed. Let the mighty listen. God, who is merciful, hears all. Come, let us go in the blessed joy of God's kindness. Amen. <laughs>